I'm pretty sure some of you who are subscribed to my channel are very intrigued as to why you're seeing an Impact Wrestling pay-per-view review in your subscription boxes. I woke up to a text message this morning from my best friend. And I got his two previous text messages last night. But I really didn't think much of it. Because who the fuck am I to care about Impact Wrestling? He says, I'm bored on a Sunday night. So bored, I'm watching Slammiversary. And then he goes on to say later on in the evening around the start of the second hour. Sammy Callahan at Pentagon Jr. was simply amazing. So then I wake up this morning and I look at all the feedback I'm getting from everybody. JD, did you watch Impact? Everybody should go out of their way and watch Slammiversary from last night. You won't be disappointed. Now, I'm going to be completely transparent with everybody watching me. This is a WWE channel. I don't watch anything else but WWE. I may dabble in Lucha Underground here and there, but I don't necessarily talk about it on the channel because it's not something that everybody gets. I may watch Impact Wrestling on a random Thursday night when I have nothing to do, but that doesn't mean I watch Impact Wrestling on the regular. I may watch New Japan when something great happens, but I won't sit here and talk about it because I just don't have an interest in talking about it. I don't have a knowledge of the product or a grasp of the product enough to sit here and give you guys quality content. I am not a fan of those products like I am a fan of WWE. I'm not a fan of those products like some of you who are more prone to watching more of that than you are of whatever WWE is regurgitating to their audiences. I watched Slammiversary last night. Actually, this morning. Woke up to all the feedback this morning. I watched it from last night, this morning. And for three hours, do you want to know what I watched? I watched what probably will be one of the best pay-per-views of 2018. One of the best pay-per-views in 2018. Three hours. Not four. Not five. Not six. Three. Three hours. And within those three hours, I was not bored. I was not tired. I was not sleepy. I did not look at the clock. Wishing it was over so I could go do something else. The only time I got up was to make a cup of coffee this morning, which I had one per hour. It's more than enough for my daily intake of coffee. But I will probably need three more for Monday Night Raw tonight. Within those three hours, I seen a fatal four-way that blew anything WWE did, to, did this year. Blew it out of the water as far as multi-man matches. It didn't make me feel like an idiot. There was not people sleeping randomly on the outside for five minutes waiting for a big spot. Everybody was involved. I seen a women's match within this three hours that blew anything on WWE pay-per-view outside of Charlotte and Asuka out of the water in Tessa Blanchard and Alley. I seen another women's match with an actual storyline. Something that we don't see on WWE television. I've seen a match of the year candidate with Sammy Callahan and Pentagon Jr. Those two men brought me back to the days of ECW when I used to watch ECW TV late at night on a Saturday night in my mom's basement with my brother. They brutalized one another to a point where you rarely see that type of shit anymore in 2018. I also seen within the three hours a tag team title match in which all four men took risks to put on a show that you could be pleased with. I also seen someone in Moose 
within this three-hour time span that fucking shut me up. Moose brought his game, his A game tonight. I was not a big fan of Moose. I never seen the appeal in Moose. I thought Moose was another one of these football players turned pro wrestler that was never going to get the job done. Boy, did he fucking prove me wrong. Boy, did WWE fuck up on passing on him. Boy, did they fuck up on passing on Sammy Callahan. Boy, did they fuck up on passing on Tessa Blanchard. Boy, did they fuck up by not showing interest in Johnny Mundo. Slammiversary 2018 was one of the best wrestling pay-per-views of 2018. And if this is what Impact Wrestling is doing in 2018 and beyond, man, am I going to start watching. Man, am I going to start watching. I had a feeling Don Callis and his wrestling knowledge and expertise and vision was going to do right by Impact Wrestling. If this was a fucking statement to the wrestling world, man, is everybody going to start paying attention to Impact Wrestling. They got me. They got me with one fucking show. I'm on the verge of fucking watching this product on a weekly basis. But the thing is, with Impact Wrestling TV, whatever we've seen at Slammiversary is not the same presentation that we see for their TV tapings, which are a taped product on Pop TV. It doesn't have the same feel, it's not the same atmosphere, it doesn't have the same energy, it doesn't have the same sound. You know everything is taped. Taped shows are, to me, a huge negative. This is why I've been stating NXT, even though they have a great atmosphere at Full full Sail. I I think their live shows, if it was weekly, would have so much more of a of a great feel on a week-to-week basis. This is why SmackDown suffered. This is why SmackDown suffered before they went live. I never watched SmackDown when it was taped. Never. There was no reason for me to watch SmackDown live. And when I did, I was very turned off by the taped atmosphere. It's just the way I am. I hate taped shows. When Monday Night Raw is taped, when they go overseas to Europe... I don't have the same interest in watching a tape show. You know it's taped by the sound, by the feel, by the look of it. And this is why I don't watch Impact Wrestling on a TV basis. But if this is any indication of what they're doing, then I might as well fucking bite the bullet and start watching what they're doing. Impact Wrestling is, right now, along with Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling, giving wrestling fans a true alternative to the bullshit entertainment that WWE is regurgitating to their universe. If this is any indication of the winds of change happening in professional wrestling, then WWE better get on board, man. NXT is simply not enough. The WWE has watered down their product so much, more and more and more, and I see it just based on my social media, based on my channel, how they're turning away people. And if this is the product that Impact and Ring of Honor and New Japan are putting forth, WWE may not be paying attention to these promotions, but little by little, nobody's ever going to compete with the WWE, but little by little, these companies collectively are stealing the thunder away from WWE. I'm telling you, the winds of change are happening in wrestling. The winds of change are happening And I don't know why WWE on Raw and SmackDown has not picked up on that. They continue to live in their own world. They continue to live in their own bubble. And the result is shitty fucking television. It's television for dummies. Meanwhile, we're getting shows like this. And then you guys are raving about the G1 Climax. And then Supercard is coming to Madison Square Garden. Things are happening, and WWE better start paying attention. And the best thing about Slammiversary last night, I did not have an inkling of an idea what was happening with any storyline going into the show. And by the end of the night, I didn't even give a shit because the good time that I had trumped everything that I should have known going in. 
I had a damn good time by the end of this thing, and that's all I want. I want to have fun watching wrestling. I want to feel like I got my my three hours worth. And that's what they did. You Impact fans, Impact Wrestling as a whole should be incredibly proud of what they did last night. This is coming from a WWE fan. This is coming from a WWE-only channel. The only time I ever covered Impact on this channel was when Matt and Jeff did the final deletions. Crazy Steve, Abyss, and then the one where Jeff and Matt fought each other. That was the only time I ever talked about Impact on this channel. And here I am giving you a review of what I watched with Slammiversary 2018. You guys should be proud. And I don't know if I'm going to review the product on a weekly basis because I get my I get way too much wrestling on my week-to-week basis. I, you know, sometimes I'm wrestled out. You know, you guys want me to cover the G1 Climax... You know, it's too much on top of what I do. Three hours of Raw, two hours of SmackDown, one hour of NXT. Then I got to get ready for off the script. It's too much. It's too much. But I swear to you, if this is what Impact Wrestling is doing, then I may have no choice. Because I do get Pop TV. I don't get El Rey. Otherwise, I'd cover Lucha Underground too. But Impact... And the fact that I do get Pop TV on Verizon Fios, I may actually start watching this product and investing my time in something because I can tell you, and you could easily tell how Don Callis cares about his product. Great fucking show last night. Absolutely fantastic show. Show started off with a fatal four-way. This was Johnny Impact. How WWE hasn't wanted this guy back? I don't know what the fuck they're thinking, man. I have been a major fan of Johnny Mundo. Major fan. How they don't want this guy back is just very, very bizarre. Uh, We got uh, Ishimori, Phoenix, and Petey Williams in the opening match. Now, it was supposed to be a Rich Swan. I can imagine how great this match would have been with Rich Swan involved. But Rich Swan actually had a concussion uh, in the middle of the week at an MLW show. I believe it was at an MLW show. And that was right here in New York at the Melrose Ballroom. The same place that Bound for Glory 2018 is taking place. I may actually get tickets to that fucking show after what I've seen with Slammiversary. So Rich Swan had a concussion. He was replaced by Petey Williams. Uh, late game uh, replacement there. It, it, you know, having Petey Williams in the match... Really didn't uh, take away from the match at all. Phoenix is absolutely fucking brilliant. How this guy moves with such fluidity and grace and perfection every single time is absolutely a marvel to see. If you watch Lucha Underground, you guys know Phoenix's work very well. The guy is fucking brilliant. He may very well be the best luchador in all of professional wrestling. I've never seen anybody move so fluidly like he does. So, Mundo, I'm a big fan of. This was my first time seeing Ishimori, honestly. Uh, Phoenix, I'm very familiar with. P- Petey Williams, I'm slightly familiar with. I have watched some of his old uh, TNA work. But this was a great Fatal 4-Way. This Fatal 4-Way was so great that... Honestly, everything that followed this up until the tag team title match and then we had Callahan and Pentagon Jr., everything that followed this match had a very difficult time living up to what this match did. This match could have been the main event. That's how good it was. And it was a fatal four-way in which everybody remained involved. There was not more than 20 to 30 seconds of somebody sleeping on the outside, resting on the outside, waiting for his big turn and big spot to get into the match and wow everybody. Everyone was involved equally. That is the one thing I took away from this match, more so than anything Phoenix did, anything Ishimori did, anything Petey Williams did, or anything Mundo did. It was the fact that I wasn't treated like an idiot and my intelligence was not insulted. 
Everybody got involved and remained involved for the majority of this match. There was an absolutely brilliant spot at the end of this match. You guys got to go and watch this thing if you don't believe what I'm telling you. Ishimori and Phoenix are in the ring, running knees in the corner on Phoenix, and then double knees to Phoenix chest. Uh, Williams rushes in to stop that, and then we all had everybody in the ring. We had a super kick party that eventually was back and forth with everybody. Literally, all four guys were trading super kicks. I believe it was Mundo and Phoenix, it was Ishimori and Petey Williams, and then they traded, and then everybody just fell. Because they all super kicked each other. It was so fucking great. Crowd is hot at this moment. Unbelievable stuff here. So Impact gets planted by Ishimori. He then heads up to the top and hits a picture perfect 450 splash. Williams then hits the Canadian Destroyer on Ishimori. So this is all in one all in one motion. Nobody stopped. Ishimori did the 450. You have the Canadian Destroyer by Petey Williams. Phoenix hits a springboard double stomp on Petey Williams that nearly took this guy's fucking head off. And then Phoenix with the cover. And, or actually, uh, Phoenix, no, Phoenix goes for a muscle buster. Then impact with a super kick and then a starship paint. So we go from a 450 splash from Ishimori. We go from that to a Canadian Destroyer by Petey Williams. Phoenix then does a double stomp off the top rope. Phoenix tries for a muscle buster. Impact with a super kick. Goes for the Starship Pain. And when he usually de delivers the sh Starship Pain, it it's as if he grazes him with his arm or he doesn't get all of it. And it looks fucking ridiculous. Like that's a finishing move. Whereas tonight, or last night rather, he hit it. And he nailed it. And he covers Phoenix for the 1-2-3, man. Absolutely fantastic opener. I don't know if it was for anything, but that match was so good that it could have main evented the show. That match was so good that everything that followed it in the first hour had a very difficult task following that match. Unbelievable stuff. So they had me hooked within the first 20 minutes of this fucking thing. Great Fatal 4-Way. Johnny Impact wins. They were hyping up that Impact actually throughout... The first pitch at the Blue Jays game that Sunday afternoon at Rogers Stadium. So, Johnny Impact gets the win here in a great fatal four-way match on Slammiversary to open the show. Tessa Blanchard versus Allie. How WWE passed on Tessa Blanchard, man. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck they were thinking, but I was big on Tessa Blanchard already. Before she even was in the Mae Young Classic in the opening round against Kyrie Sane. And then I had Tessa Blanchard grace a House of Glory ring. She was great there. And here we are in Impact Wrestling. And Tessa Blanchard is proving everybody, you didn't sign me, you're fucking loss. I don't know if it was the attitude issues that were cited. I don't know if it was the behavioral issues in the back. Or, or, or in the locker room that she was wildly known for that WWE passed on. But whatever they passed on, you know, if you're someone that talented, I don't give a shit what's going on. You could reel them in, you could tone them down a little bit, and, and, and you know, bestow some knowledge upon them about how to act and be a locker room leader. Tessa Blanchard is way too talented to pass on like that. And she proved that tonight, man. This was a one-on-one -on -one match with Allie. It was for no title. It wasn't for a contendership. Or it wasn't at least listed as one for the Women's Championship. But they did cite at the end of this thing that whoever wins this match has to be in contention for the Women's Championship. This match was better than any WWE pay-per-view women's match outside of Charlotte and Asuka at WrestleMania this year. This is how you do women's pay-per-view. This is how you do women's wrestling. The fact that WWE is citing, or, or, or is citing historical announcements and more championships rumored on the line and a women's revolution and all this other fucking bullshit. How WWE has Barbie doll women's champions right now in Bliss and Carmella on Raw and SmackDown, SmackDown respectively. And then you watch Tessa Blanchard work on Impact last night. I, I mean... She is money. Mella ain't money. Bliss ain't money. 
Tessa is money. And Allie, that's the first time, literally. You, you, you guys got to be patient with me. Watching Allie for the first time, I don't know anything about Impact Wrestling. Watching Allie for the first time, she even fucking impressed me too. First time watching her in the ring. The one thing I don't like about Tessa Blanchard, and I'm not sure if this plays into her character or not, you know, there is a certain cockiness or a certain level of cockiness that one should, you know, exude. And it, it, it's as if Tessa Blanchard knows that she's from a heralded in a respected wrestling family and a wrestling background. And she just exudes that cockiness as if, look at me, look at who my relatives are. Look at who I'm related to. Look at my background over everybody else. Now, I'm not sure if that fits into her, into her character or, or not, but, you know, she's been doing this for two and a half, three years. And she's great at what she does. But that doesn't mean you're better than everybody else just because of who your family is. You know, there's a certain humbleness that one should have. And I don't know, again, like, if that's her character or if that's truly what she thinks she is, that she's better than everybody else. But that's the one turnoff about her that I don't like. But other than that, again, how WWE passed on Tessa Blanchard coming out of the Mae Young Classic and didn't offer a fucking contract whenever her contract was up with whomever she was with, that's a huge loss for WWE. She's going to be a monster star. And Impact, I'm telling you right now, got a steal in Tessa Blanchard. There's no doubt in my mind that she's going to be TNA, or not TNA, I still call it TNA, Impact Wrestling Women's Champion, man. This was a great match. Allie with a lung blower. We've seen a lot of lung blowers last night at Slammiversary. Allie with a lung blower. Allie then charges into the corner. Uh, Tessa popped Allie right in the face. Allie was stuck in the corner. Uh, fighting back here, both are on the second rope. Tessa up top hits a Huron Conrana that nearly decapitated Allie, man. When she came down from that Hurricane Rana, man, the impact of that Hurricane Rana was like, holy shit. So, I don't know how, how Allie survived that one, but it was pretty fucking nasty. Right on her neck. Allie kicks out. So, Allie kicks out, tries for one of her own, Tessa with the cover. Allie with a super kick, lands that flush right in the face, goes for a pin, two count only. Allie tries to pick Tessa up and does so. Tessa gets back to her feet, quickly hits a hammerlock DDT. One, two, three. Tessa Blanchard makes a huge statement at Slammiversary. This is the woman that you need to run through if you want to be called the queen of Impact Wrestling's women's division, man. She is great at what she does. I'm a huge fan of what she does, and I can't wait to see her more, man. Uh, and see where she goes from here. That was a great match. That's a women's match that I think we could all be proud of. And it makes you wonder why we're not seeing this type of shit on WWE pay-per-view. They gave these women ample fucking time to tell a story and get their, their, you know, whatever they got going on across to the audience. WWE doesn't do that. We're, we're, we're getting fucking clown-like circus acts with Carmella and we got Bliss, who's afraid to take a fucking bump. And she's giving excuses on social media as to why she doesn't wrestle. Oh, she's a heel, this and that. Tessa Blanchard played a heel in this match, and she wrestled her fucking heart out. So why can't you do the same as Raw Women's Champion? Excuses, excuses, excuses. Everybody else is doing the women's division right. WWE seems to want to push Barbie dolls instead of real women's wrestling. And we got more nausea getting bullshit to come on Monday Night Raw with an announcement from Stephanie McMahon. Tessa Blanchard wins via pinfall, and that was a great women's match. So right out of the gate, we got a women's match and a fatal four-way that have instantaneously grabbed my attention for Slammiversary. Tommy Dreamer versus Eddie Edwards in a House of Hardcore match. This was actually very fun. It was short. It was enough to get your fill in on what whatever they were trying to tell. If I had one downfall from this match, it was the fact that they left the fans hanging at the end. So, 
we get Tommy Dreamer here on the second turnbuckle, and he's got two chairs propped up facing each other, two steel chairs, which was a common thing on this show. Two, two steel chairs facing each other. He does the Dreamer Driver off the second turnbuckle right through the steel chairs, or what they call the Spicoli Driver. When I was watching ECW back in the day, it was the Dreamer Driver. So he goes for the Spicoli Driver through the chairs, two count only. Now, normally, that's a spot that would finish off somebody. Eddie Edwards kicks out. You had kendo sticks. You had steel chairs. You had Tommy Dreamer grab somebody's beer and smash the beer over Edwards' face. And it, it was nice. When Dreamer did that, he actually looked at the, at the young lady he, who he took the beer from, and, and, I, and I think he says, don't worry, I'll get you another one. Because he grabbed the full beer from her hand. You know, we had cookie sheets, and we had... Uh, trash cans, it, it was your typical hardcore, hardcore match, so the, Sp the Spicoli driver through the chairs, goes to the cover, only gets a two count, so Dreamer brings a table into the room, and this is what I stated earlier, they left the fans hanging, Dreamer brings in a table, and he brings lighter fluid in the ring, and I immediately got flashbacks from Mick Foley and Edge at WrestleMania 22. So Dreamer brings in the table, he douses the table in lighter fluid, and Dreamer goes to light it, but Edwards hits a low blow. Edwards sets up a chair, hits his shining wizard, which he calls the Boston Knee Party, and it sends the chair right into Dreamer's face, goes to the pin, one, two, three. This was a decent hardcore match. But if you are going to do a table spot, and this is my only criticism about this match, if you're going to do a table spot like that, you're going to go to the lengths of Dreamer setting up the table and then dousing the table in lighter fluid, and you're going to give me an ending like you gave me last night with Edwards stopping whatever Dreamer had planned, and then he goes for his finisher and then the cover, and then you don't give the fans the table spot with the table on fire, you're really setting everybody up for disappointment at that point. These two had a decent hardcore match. And the only thing people are going to remember from that hardcore match is the fact that Tommy Dreamer didn't get to set the table on fire. If you're not going to do that spot, then don't give me the fan the visual of setting up the table and then dousing it in lighter fluid. Because that's all the fans are going to remember. Oh, Tommy Dreamer was thwarted with a flaming table spot. Fuck Eddie Edwards. That's all they're going to remember. That's all I remember. That's the one thing that, that I'm going to take away from that match. Dreamer set the table up and he didn't set it on fire. Come on, man. Can't be doing that type of shit. If you weren't going to go through all the way with that spot, then don't give it to me at all. Seriously. Eddie Edwards wins post-match. Edwards goes to hit Dreamer with a kendo stick, but decides to help him up instead. Apparently, Edwards thought Dreamer was sleeping with his wife. And Dreamer tried to stop Eddie Edwards from killing Sammy Callahan. This is what I gathered from the storyline. And Edwards took his frustrations out on Dreamer. He was going to kill Callahan, was Edwards. And Dreamer stopped him, and he took his anger out on Dreamer. So, post-match, Dreamer gets the kendo stick and holds it out and points it at Edwards. He doesn't want to hit him. And his wife, Alicia, comes out. And Edwards is just standing there, and his wife is yelling at him. Shake Dreamer's hand. He eventually does. He points the kendo stick to Edwards, hands it off, as if he's, like, passing the torch to Eddie Edwards as the new hardcore icon in Impact Wrestling. And that was it. Eddie Edwards' wife heads to the back, and that was it. Pretty decent match, but that table spot, I mean, if you're going to give me the visual, then go all the way with it. If not then there was no reason for that spot whatsoever, and they should have just went right to the ending. That's just what I gather from it. Let me know what you guys think about that. Matt Seidel versus Brian Cage for the Impact X Division Championship. Now, when you look at Matt Seidel, you look at someone who is a quintessential perfect X Division type guy. When you look at Brian Cage, you wonder why this guy's not fighting for the Impact World title. Brian Cage is the farthest thing from an ex-division competitor. But Brian Cage is a fucking freak of nature, man. When you watch him in Lucha Underground, the guy is fucking 
So athletic for a man his size. It's absolutely freaky. So to see Brian Cage do standing moonsaults and be as athletic as he is, is a great thing to see, man. Brian Cage, not the prototypical, you know, big, muscly, you know, gargantuan type guy. He's a damn good athlete. And I really appreciate the athleticism we see from Brian Cage. Um, the one thing in this match, the one thing in this match, clearly Seidel was outmatched power-wise, size-wise. Brian Cage was throwing around Seidel like a fucking rag doll, you know, just flipping him around, throwing him around, doing modified moves, uh, a reverse Death Valley driver. He was, he was all over the place just tossing this guy around, having his way with him. So Cage was looking to finish Seidel off and Seidel hits a snap rana for a two count. So Seidel looks to go up to the top. He's looking to fly and finish Cage off. Cage catches him in midair, tries for his drill claw, and that was counted into a pin. Knee to the, to the jaw by Seidel, and he goes up top. Now, this is where everything broke down. I don't know if this was planned. It didn't look like it was planned, and it looked like Seidel had a lapse in judgment and he completely undershot Brian Cage with his air side L. He goes for the ro- he goes for the top rope and he goes for air side L and he misses it. He fell short, botched. And I think Brian Cage tried to play it off as clean as he could for the right ending. I think he was supposed to do air side L and he was supposed to catch him coming down and then go for his finishing move. But Seidel undershot, he missed him completely, and they went right for the ending, which seen Brian Cage win the X Division Championship and beat Matt Seidel in what looked to be a botched ending. But the match was fun. You know, it's always great seeing an underdog like Matt Seidel try and come back against a big guy like Brian Cage. Brian Cage, uh, they put over, he beat Lashley, he has not been pinned clean by anybody. He only lost via countout to Seidel. And when I look at Brian Cage, I see somebody that's going to be a major player for Impact Wrestling. I could easily see him challenging for the World Heavyweight Championship. So he, he right now is the new X Division champion, and he beat Matt Seidel here in a very fun match. So we're running through these matches. The first match clearly stood out above everything else. I don't think anybody that followed it up until this point was even close to that Fatal 4-Way. And the women's match is right there with the Fatal 4-Way. Great stuff. So we had the House of Hardcore match with Dreamer and Edwards. We had Brian Cage versus Seidel, which was a fun match for the X Division Championship. So, so far, so good up until this point for Slammiversary. Sue Young, the Impact Women's Champion, who also wrestled for House of Glory. She wrestled Sonya Strong last year. Uh, Sue Young versus Madison Rain. For the Impact Knockouts Championship, this was more storyline-driven than anything. Very, very nice visuals here, man. I, I really appreciate Sue Young's character and her desire to be different in this day and age where women are on the up and up for professional wrestling. Sue Young stands out as different, unique. She's got that dead bride or the undead bride, almost like a like a, a, a zombie, you know, bride theme going on, and it's very very unique. So whatever she does is going to be very much visual and very storyline driven. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of Sue Young to really hone in on her wrestling skill, but just by how she presents herself, she presents herself as a must see act. Madison Rain, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't find anything to be stand out about her, no matter how many times they tout that she's a multi-time knockouts champion. I don't see anything in Madison Rain that really stands out. To me, she's just like everybody else that I would see on Raw or SmackDown that fit that mold. Beautiful, thin, and diva-esque. That's, the, that's what I get from Madison Rain. So... You guys may have a different perception of Madison Rain, but I appreciate a character more like Sue Young over a Madison Rain. Like I said, this was very visual. Sue Young comes out with her bridesmaids, and they're carrying a casket. She's in the casket, very Undertaker-esque. She rises from the casket with the women's championship in hand. And 
at the end of this thing, she makes the referee stop the match as she gets her mandible claw finisher on Madison Rain. And Madison Rain doesn't tap. She doesn't submit. She just passes out. That's it. Madison Rain fades away. And the ref calls it. Madison Rain is knocked out cold. And Sue Young retains the women's championship. At the end of this thing, Sue Young rolls Madison Rain towards the coffin. She puts her in the coffin and then stands on it as she headbangs to her music with the women's championship in grasp. Uh, obviously, the lesser of the two women's matches here. This one was more storyline driven, this was more visual. And Tessa Blanchard versus Ali was more of the competitive nature of what the knockouts are capable of. But. I appreciated this because going into this, it looked like they were telling a decent story, something that I wish WWE would do with their females. Sue Young retains the Knockout Women's Championship. LAX versus the OGs. This is for the Impact World Tag Team Championship. This was a 51-50 street fight. Now, I have a little grasp on what's going on here. So we get the old LAX versus the new LAX. That's what we're going for here. So who, whoever the OGs were, you know, Homicide and Hernandez with King, they obviously betrayed the modern day version of LAX, and now we're getting old versus new. And it's gang warfare right now, you know? We're not going to allow the new guys to come in our turf and lead this division. You got to run through us. That's what I grasp from this. Now, I am very familiar with Santana and Ortiz. Uh, I've called many of their matches in House of Glory. Honestly, from what I see, these guys are some of the best workers in tag team wrestling right now in the world. And I love what they do. They're very lively, especially with House of Glory. They're very lively. They are very fun to watch. But when it's time to get serious, you will not find two guys that are more serious at their craft than Santana and Ortiz. At Slammiversary, it was not time for games at all. These guys came down wearing face paint. They came down wanting to shed blood. They came down to fight. And that's exactly what they did. This was a great tag team title match. It was very, very reminiscent of old school ECW. A lot of what I've seen on this show was very old school ECW. Uh, there was so much that happened in this match that I really don't want to go over it all. Um, I really can't give you a good perception on what we've seen here. This was four men legitimately beating the shit out of one another. Seriously. And LAX retained the tag team titles here. There were tables, there were cookie sheets, there were trash cans, there were... Hernandez just fucking doing what he does. Hernandez is a fucking bulldozer, man. The guy is a fucking bulldozer. Santana and Ortiz, they love to fly. We've seen some great spots. We've seen some great table spots. Death Valley Driver from Santana on Homicide. And Hernandez then picked up Santana and then gave him a razor's edge through another table that was propped up against the turnbuckle in the corner. This was great stuff. Really, really good stuff here. Uh, Conan got on the ring apron towards the end of this match and was just berating Homicide and talking trash to Homicide. In the ring was Santana, who, you know, it, it came off kind of sloppy, if you ask me, because I watched this. Conan's on the apron. He's talking shit to Homicide. Conan has something in his hand, and he throws it to Santana. It was a bag of thumbtacks. Now, Homicide looked back as Conan threw this unknown object into the ring. Instead of turning around to find out what he threw to Santana in the ring, he turns right back around and starts talking more trash to Conan. Which I didn't understand why. It made Homicide look like a dummy. It made him look like a dummy. But what Conan threw Santana was a sack of thumbtacks. So Santana thumps, uh, dumps the thumbtacks out, and he picks up a handful of thumbtacks, throws the thumbtacks in, in Homicide's face, blinds him, and then at the end of that, I don't know what he did. What did he do here for the finish? He gave him a... I don't know what he gave him. 
He gave him a, a Death Valley driver and, or, or, or a uh, Michinoku driver, I believe it was, on the thumbtacks. And, and then he goes up for a, flo- a frog splash and then right on top of the thumbtacks, delivers the frog splash, and that's going to do it. LAX retains the Impact World Tag Team Championships. Um, at the end of this thing, you had the OGs come on in and beat the shit out of LAX. They beat the shit out of Conan. They were whipping Conan with what looked to be, I think Don Callis mentioned it was like a, a sock with a, a fucking uh, eight ball in it or, 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 or something like that, a pool ball. I don't know what it was. It looked like some type of billy club. They were beating Conan over the back with it. He's got bad hips. They acknowledged the bad hips. He's old. He's broken down. And they were beating the old man right down to the canvas. So then they pick up the tag team championships and they deface the tag team championships with spray paint. And they hold the tag team championships up in the air as they disrespected not only LAX Conan, but the Impact World Tag Team Championship. So this doesn't look like it's come to its conclusion. And we will look to see if LAX seeks retribution again against the OGs in Hernandez and Homicide. Very, very fun tag team match. It looked like Santana was busted open on the forehead. I don't know what spot caused that. It looked like he had a fucked up wrist. Uh, He was trying to pull back at the end of the match on his wrist. He was bleeding profusely on his wrist. All four of these guys beat the shit out of one another, man. Homicide was fucked up badly. Hernandez was bleeding from his forehead. They, They literally beat the shit out of one another, man. All four guys deserve a lot of credit. And LAX, man, when their time is is due up in Impact Wrestling, you know, the sky's the limit for these guys to go anywhere and and be successful. These guys are great at what they do. You're not going to find a better tag team today than LAX. And I know firsthand because I work with them in House of Glory and what they've done with House of Glory has been fantastic. And again, stellar work here in Impact Wrestling. What could be the... Match of the night, easily. Match of the night for, for a, a multitude of reasons. This may very well be one of the best matches of 2018 when we talk about best matches in wrestling for 2018. Pentagon Dark, Pentagon Jr. in Impact Wrestling versus Sammy Callahan. This was hair versus mask. Now, Sammy Callahan, I, I told my best friend Pete, and, you know, he, he, he pretty much was blunt with me. How WWE didn't know what to do with Sammy Callahan is, is, is unbelievable. Really. How they didn't know what to do with Sammy Callahan when he was in NXT is fucking mind-boggling to me. The guy's money. Now, the guy may have pushed me down. The guy may have put his fucking boot on my face at the last House of Glory event at Temperature Rising. But I'm going to sit here and I'm going to be an honest reviewer. The guy may be a fucking piece of shit, but the guy calls himself the draw. The guy warrants you to pay attention to him. The guy is money. Sammy Callahan right now is one of the most talked about talents in the indie world. And if you want a modern day take on Mick Foley... Sammy Callahan's your guy. He fits the mold. The guy will do anything to get a reaction from the crowd. He's sadistic. He's fucking disrespectful. He's crazy. The guy's maniacal. And I absolutely fucking love every bit of it. He is great at what he does. The chemistry that was felt just watching this. Never mind being there. The chemistry felt watching this between him and Pentagon was off the charts. You are not going to find a better hardcore match this year. And these guys gave you hardcore down to the very essence of what that fucking term means. Unbelievable. Now, I don't even know where to begin with this shit. I don't even know where to begin with this shit. It, 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 It all started with the fucking railroad spikes. How railroad spikes are underneath the ring for whatever reason. I don't know if they were used for the ring. I don't know if they were just placed there just for the fuck of it, but Don Callis labeled them as railroad spikes. 
So he picks up these spikes and brings them into the ring, does Callahan. He's ripping the mask off Pentagon at this point so that he has clear access for these railroad spikes to drive them into the flesh of Pentagon Jr. And he hits Pentagon with the spikes over and over and over again and starts digging with the spikes into his flesh. Spit, mucus, whatever fluids coming from Sammy Callahan's face is perfectly just captured on camera. The guy is fucking a maniacal fuck. The guy is great at what he does. Pentagon's mask now is ripped to a point where Callahan takes his mask and ties him up as if, as if he's hanging clothes out to dry on the top rope. Pentagon has nowhere to go. And he takes the part of the mask that's ripped and he ties it up on the top rope. So he's tied up now. He's bleeding from the, the railroad spikes. Callahan grabs his bat, charges. Pentagon kicks him away, frees himself, delivers a devastating lung blower, and then grabs the spikes himself does Pentagon. He clangs them together like it's fucking dinner time and he goes to tap one like he's he's taking the fucking spike and, and nailing it on his fucking head. At this point, I'm just like, oh my God, what the fuck are you doing? You do not see this type of shit anywhere in professional wrestling nowadays. So I commend Impact Wrestling for not giving a fuck about what they tried to tell here. I love it. I absolutely love it. So, he starts just nailing the spike into Callahan's head. Callahan grabs his bat, charges, Pentagon kicks it away, frees himself, like I said, starts hammering the spikes. He gets it into Callahan's head, takes the bat, and then taps the spike into Callahan's head with the bat. <laughs> I don't know what this... I don't know what I'm watching at this point. I'm laughing. I'm texting my friend. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? This is crazy. Absolutely crazy. So they both sit down in chairs. They start punching away at each other. There's chairs now brought into the ring. They grab the chairs. They start swinging at each other. Both men fall to the mat after repeated steel chair shots. Fight forever rings out in the arena. Super kicks by Pentagon, another lung blower for a two count. Pentagon looks to snap Callahan's arm, uh, and the crowd is chanting, break his arm. I never liked Pentagon Jr.'s uh, arm break. It it's fucking ridiculous. You know, you're going to break somebody's arm, their arm's going to be broken, and, and the story you're going to tell is that, oh, look, he he's, he's back, and, you know, he's good to go at the next set of tapings, you know. Uh, Pentagon broke a referee's arm. In this match. Because he was blinded by the blood seeping into his face that he thought it was Callahan. So I don't like that spot. Because he did that spot to Callahan right before the ending of this match. And then Callahan got up. Callahan got up like if his arm was fucking good to go. You know? So I don't like that spot. I don't like the terminology. Oh, he broke his arm. I think we got to find a new way to just sell that move. You know? So, break his arm. Callahan counters. So we get the Christ brothers to try and jump in and thwart this attack by Pentagon. Pentagon takes a chair, delivers shots to both of their faces on opposite sides of the ring. Callahan throws some powder in Pentagon's eyes, and then he smacks the ref. He smacks the ref. He can't see, and he thinks it's Callahan. He grabs the referee. He thinks... The referee is Callahan. So he, he delivers uh, the arm break to the referee and the crowd is chanting, you fucked up. So Pentagon driver eventually nailed on Callahan. Nobody's there to make the cover. I'm like, oh my God, what are you doing? Callahan drops Pentagon, still nobody. Another ref finally shows up. Pentagon able to kick out. Callahan sets up four chairs. You got two chairs facing each other, four in total. So Callahan sets these chairs up in the middle of the ring. He climbs up on top with Pentagon. He gets poked in the eye. Package, pile driver, cover, he kicked out. He kicked out. Again, mucus and whatever liquid's coming from Callahan's face and mouth, 
just all over the place. How he kicked out of that spot, I don't know. That was the perfect ending to this fucking war that we're seeing here at Slammiversary. Kicks out. Sammy then spits. He's on his hands and knees. Sammy spits at Pentagon in his face. Pentagon snaps his arm. Another package pile driver covers, and this fucking chaos, this war, is finally over. And it resulted in one of the best matches of 2018. Post-match, Pentagon grabs the Clippers off the announced desk. The Chris brothers show up, try to stop it. Callahan able to run away, but Phoenix and security come down and just thwart off everybody here, allowing Pentagon to shave the head of Sammy Callahan. There was a chant of shave his beard. That was not happening. But Callahan does not look bad with a shaven head. So next time I see him at House of Glory on August 17th, he is going one-on-one with Low Key, already announced. So he's going to have a shaved head when I see him next, man. Fantastic fucking match. Fantastic match. The chemistry between these two guys was absolutely fucking off the charts. Brilliant stuff. Unbelievable. Finally, guys, in the main event, Austin Aries versus Moose for the Impact World Championship. Uh, The atmosphere here, it had a big fight feel to it. Uh, It probably would have felt bigger to me if I've been watching Impact Wrestling and storylines leading up to this match. I was not sold on Moose. I was not sold on Moose at all. I thought he was another ex-football player looking to reap the benefits of the professional wrestling world. You know, he's a big guy. I didn't think he was going to be as athletic as he is. You know, I didn't really find him to be all that special. Uh, I felt he was just very generic in appearance and very generic in the ring. But boy, did he shut me up, man. Uh, Moose brought his A game. And and if that's how Moose usually is, then you guys got a winner in Moose. He brought his A game, and I didn't really think with the size of Moose compared to Austin Aries that this was really going to be a match, but they gelled very well together, man. And Austin Aries, man, you know, he may be, you know, 205 pounds, but he is freakishly fucking powerful. The guy delivered a brain buster suplex to Moose on multiple occasions and made it look like child's play. Really, Austin Aries is fucking prime talent, and how WWE failed on booking him on 205 Live, man, did they fuck up. They even miscast him in NXT. Impact got another fucking steal, man. Austin Aries, WWE had a gem in him, and boy, is he shutting them fucking up with everything he does. This was a damn good match, man. These guys went 15 minutes, and Moose was very impressive. Austin Aries uh, hung around with Moose, or I should say it's the other way around. Moose hung with Austin Aries. We all knew Austin Aries was going to be able to go. But Moose hung with Austin Aries to a point where I thought it was a a very, very good main event match and worthy of a main event match. Um, Moose actually dumped Austin Aries into the crowd towards the end of this thing. He deadlifted him into the crowd, and then he got back into the ring. And he didn't realize that, listen, you can't win the title on the outside. Referee's counting this guy out, so he has to break the referee's count. So he goes back into the crowd, and he grabs Aries and brings him back into the ring. Now, they're both on the stage, fighting back and forth. Like I said, he throws Ares into the security. Uh, He gets him back into the ring. Ares then launches double knees into Moose, and then hits a brain buster back on the outside. Made it look like child's play, like ease. So, he was looking for a count out. Referee's counting up till nine before Moose gets back in the ring. Ares with a kick to the head, a punt kick to the head that rang out throughout the entire arena. Aries then goes to the announce table and grabs the title. Now, Curtis Granderson, a Toronto Blue Jays baseball player, was, I guess, the timekeeper for this match. He was overseeing the belt. He was the belt protector of this match. He gets on the apron and grabs the title from Aries, Moose, with a very, very climactic pinfall. Schoolboy for it, too. Aries then grabs uh, a kick to the head here and another brain buster, and boom, the match is over. Austin Aries retains the Impact World Championship for a 1-2-3 with another beautiful picture-perfect brain buster. But, man, did, did Moose bring this? Moose delivered a spear that almost cut Austin Aries in half. There was some good back and forth here between these guys. 
uh, big chops. There was a spot where Aries delivered devastating knife edge chops, and Moose was just eating them up left and right. One, two, three, four. He was like, come on, is that all you got? Uh, Moose, you know, he actually, I believe, did a uh, cross body. He missed it, but he delivered a cross body. So Moose, for a guy his size, what is he, about six, seven, six, eight? The guy could fucking fly. I did not know about Moose coming in. I knew of him, but I didn't know what he was capable of. But he hung with Austin Aries till the very end of this 15-minute main event, man. Very good stuff. Austin Aries retains. He is still the Impact World Champion. And at the end of this thing, Granderson hands the title to Aries in a very cocky way. He asks for the title, and then he ushered Granderson out of the ring as he celebrated retaining the Impact World Championship in what was a excellent pay-per-view for Impact Wrestling, man. Good stuff. I am shocked. Impact Wrestling sold me, and I may be a regular viewer from this point on. This was a very good pay-per-view, man. Impact brought extreme more so than WWE did their extreme rules. If that's not an indication that WWE needs to put away these, or do away with these gimmick pay-per-views, I don't know what is, man. How you look at that Sammy Callahan match against Pentagon Jr. and then want to put on a pay-per-view like Extreme Rules? Give me a fucking break, bro. Holy shit. Impact Wrestling brought it. They should be proud. Scott Demore, Don Callis should be proud. Fans of this company should be proud. Now, I understand that everybody's making fun of Impact Wrestling on my timeline. You know, people think it's 2010 all over again with all these positive things to say about Impact Wrestling. Let's do away with all the mistakes that they made. Let's do away with all the bad business decisions that they did with old, with old management. With Don Callis and Scott DeMore, they want to usher in a new generation. They want to usher in a new era. Let's sweep that shit under the rug. Yeah, they've been given chance after chance after chance after chance. But if, but if Slammiversary was any indication of the direction of this company, man, you guys should be proud of where they're fucking going. This is coming from a WWE-only channel. Excellent shit. Probably go down as one of the best pay-per-views all year for 2018. You get my fucking approval. Two thumbs up, man. That is your Slammiversary review. If you guys want to see more impact, let me know down below. I'll see you guys tonight for Monday Night Raw. Until then, I am JD. Thank you guys so very much. Please check out House of Glory, where you guys can see the likes of Sammy Callahan, LAX, Austin Aries, August 17th, HOGWrestling.net, High Intensity 7. And then check out my Cutting Corners debut episode with Matt Travis, one of the students at the House of Glory Academy. Thank you guys so very much. I'll see you guys tonight for Monday Night Raw. Until then, have a great Monday. Hit that thumbs up. I'll see you guys tonight for another quote-unquote historic Monday Night Raw. I'll talk to you later.